One of my favorite phrases from uh, Mises in his writings was he referred to some socialist writers as muddle-headed babblers. That was, he used, it, I run across that all the time in Mises' writing, muddle-headed babblers. And, uh, and maybe that's the title for next book. That'd be a good, good, good book title. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, why, why, basically is why it's more important than ever uh, to support the Mises Institute and the work of the Mises Institute. And I'm going to, I'm going to make this point in the context of a concept that Mises wrote about in his great book, Socialism, first published in German in 1922. In the last couple of chapters, he talks about something called destructionism. And, uh, and so I'm gonna talk about destructionism in Mises' time and our time. And it is this phenomenon, which is why, like I said, it is more urgent than ever to support the work of the Mises Institute. And uh, before I start, I, I'll give you one hint as to why I think it's more, more important now than ever, is that I've been teaching uh, at the university level a long time, and I uh, got my PhD in 1979 when I was 24, and uh, one of the big, the, probably the biggest difference I've seen in the students who come in to the university is today, they're already thoroughly brainwashed in cultural Marxism and socialism and, and political correctness, whereas 15 or 20 years ago, that was not true, at least in my experience. Uh, and that there'd be some percentage of them that would get a, that'd be sort of corralled by the, the leftists on the campus who would pretty much waste their education years and turn them into sort of you know, muddle-headed babblers, basically. <laughs> and, uh, but today, uh, I've noticed that they're all very well programmed right when they get there. And, and that's uh, the success of uh, 25 or 30 years of uh, K through 12 and beyond propagandizing by what we call the cultural Marxists. And so, in, in, uh, in, but in Mises' day, these, when he talks about destructionism, let me give you an idea of what he had to talk about, or what he was talking about. He said, I'm going to read just a few quotes from the book Socialism, first published in English in 1936. Socialism is not the pioneer of a better and finer world, but the spoiler of what thousands of years of civilization have created. It does not build, it destroys, for destruction is the essence of it. It produces nothing. It only consumes what the social order based on private ownership in the means of production has created. Each step leading towards socialism must, must exhaust itself in the destruction of what already exists. That was also, there was always a two-pronged strategy by the socialists. One, destroy the existing institutions of society and then build their utopia, step two, whatever their utopia might be. Uh, then he said something that reminded me a lot of Sweden and Venezuela. He said this, progressive capital formation is the only means by which the position of the great masses can be permanently improved. Socialism and destructionism propose to use up capital so as to achieve present wealth at the expense of the future. The policy of destructionism is the policy of the spendthrift who dissipates his inheritance regardless of the future. And uh, you know the story of Sweden is that they were, it was a great uh, high economic liberty society in the late 19th, early 20th century. They had all these great entrepreneurs that had created Volvo, uh, you know, automobiles and, and, and all companies like that, Saab and, and many others. And then when they adopted their version of socialism in the 1950s, they basically started eating up their capital and living off the efforts of previous generations until by the 1980s, they had 500% interest rates. And they've been trying to escape from that ever since. And of course, Venezuela, the exact same thing. One of the wealthiest countries in Latin America for, for a long, long time. They adopted socialism uh, basically in the 50s also. And uh, each president that they elected since then, they adopted democracy in 1958, uh, I, I think of as a, a bigger Castro-loving communist than the last guy. And look at what has happened to them. So they lived off the capital of the previous generation. A third quote from Mises. He said, for Karl Marx, quote, all politics was only the continuation of war by other means. The socialist parties who have taken the Marxist parties for their model have elaborated the technique of agitation, the caging for votes and for souls, the stirring up of electoral excitement, the street demonstrations, and the terrorism. And this reminds me of, I wrote notes here, Antifa, Black Lives Matter, Democratic Socialists of America, 
the, the, the muddle-headed, babbling students who set buildings on fire and scream in the faces of conservatives or, or libertarians who show up at places like Berkeley to give an invited lecture. Uh, that, that's you know, nothing new, nothing new. Mises uh, observed that. He made a comment also on uh, the fake news of his day. He said this, the, the literati are recruiting agents for socialism since socialism must destroy society and they are paving the way for destructionism, the literati. He also made a comment that I put in the politically correct category of commentary. He said this, peoples which have hailed with great enthusiasm the writings which call for the destruction of all cultural values are themselves on the verge of a great social catastrophe. So he was criticizing what today we would call political correctness. And then he uh, sort of concludes that our whole life is so given over to destructionism that one can name hardly a field into which it has not penetrated. Social art, he put quotation marks over social. Social art preaches it, schools teach it, the churches disseminate it. And so that's destructionism. And of course, he talks about the methods. You know, he, he says, I'm going to have a, a, a brief discussion of some of the methods of, of uh, destructionism. And this is 1922. Labor legislation, compulsory social insurance, uh, unemployment insurance, nationalization, taxation, and inflation is what he writes about. And of course, in his day, uh, he was uh, also commenting on, if you look at um, the Communist Manifesto, which I use in a class, I have a class I teach called Capitalism and Its Critics, and I have, I've had students read the Communist Manifesto and, and then the works by social, of socialism, the book Socialism, and go back and forth, the good guys and the bad guys, uh, read this. And one of my students told me, you know, this is the fourth time I've been assigned the Communist Manifesto, but, <laughs> but, but th this is the first time it wasn't looked at as a roadmap to the future. <laughs> it was very, very different. And, it's a true story. That's, that's, a, that's a, a, absolutely true. And the same student once told me, I didn't know there were, I had no idea there were different schools of thought in economics. I, I thought it was all a system of equations, mathematical equations. Yeah, this is a junior economics major who told me that. <clears throat> and of course, if you look at the Kami Manifesto, it's, it's a manifesto for how to destroy the existing capitalist society. Uh, plank number one, abolition of private property. Plank number two, uh, this is a direct quote, a heavy progressive or graduated income tax. Number three, abolition of all rights of inheritance. That's another attack on private property. Number four is confiscation, confiscation of land of those who speak out against the government. That's a direct quote from the Commie Manifesto. So that's a, that's a twofer. That's a de destruction of private property and a destruction of free speech at the same time. Number five, centralization of credit in the hands of the state. So, you know, I, put a, I have a little picture, it says uh, Greenspan, Bernanke, and the, and the margin over here. <coughs> I gave a talk <coughs> at the Cato Institute many years ago on the 100th anniversary of the Sherman Antitrust Act. And I, I, for some reason, Alan Greenspan came up, and I remember mentioning that uh, I read one of Greenspan's old articles on antitrust from one of his Ayn Rand days, and, uh, and I commented that, uh, well, that's before he became a central planner. And, uh, and uh, I don't know, some of the people at Cato had a big sourpuss looks on their face when I said that. <laughs> they, they, they didn't want people to think of the Fed as a central planning agency, of God, for God's sake. Uh, uh, <clears throat> centralization of communication and transportation, nationalization of all land and capital, and my favorite, free education in government schools. So that was, that was the recipe for destructionism, Misesian destructionism in the Communist Manifesto, which he was talking about. And of course, in our day, it's a little different. Uh, the, 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 the methods of destructionism, we, you know, we've, we've adopted all these things. It's all, you know, in, the, in the United States, we've got every one of these things. Uh, uh, to some extent, uh, we've adopted them. But we're going even further today. We're going much further today. And uh, you know that today's Marxists, the ones that are most influential, go by the name of cultural Marxists. A little different, different variety of uh, Marxism. <clears throat> and, uh, as I've said before, after the worldwide collapse of socialism in the late 80s and early 90s, 
there was a, a conundrum among the Marxists. Uh, what are we going to do now? Uh, some of them became what I call watermelons, green on the outside, red on the inside, environmentalists, <laughs> and decided to try to destroy capitalism in the, in the name of the worms and the bugs and the snakes and, and the, you know, Mother Nature <clears throat> and all that sort of thing. <clears throat> and uh, the old class conf conflict theory didn't fly because the working class never wanted to uh, engage in a bloody revolution and take over the factories. They just wanted a pay raise and better working conditions. And so the Marxists of the day were very upset that uh, the working class never bought into this. <clears throat> so what do we do? Well, they set up a different type of class struggle. It's no longer the capitalist class and the, and the working class. Now it's the oppressor class and the oppressed class. And basically the oppressors are white heterosexual males and the oppressed is everybody else <laughs> in, in, in the literature. <laughs> And the goal, <clears throat> so because the failure of the working class to, to overthrow capitalism, uh, the goal now is the destruction of Western culture because some of the theorists, people like uh, Antonio Gramsci, the Italian Marxist, and uh, George Lukács, his real name is uh, Georgi, but I'll call him George uh, Lukács, they, they needed a change of strategy. And their theory was that the reason why the working class did not embrace uh, Marxist revolutions was that Western culture and Christianity blinded them to the Marxist truth. And they claimed that the combination of Western culture, which of course would include classical liberalism, the philosophy of cl classical liberalism, and the institutions of capitalism themselves, and Christianity, <clears throat> created what uh, Lukács called a hegemonic power which maintains the uh, consent to the capitalist order. So he said the, the working class was too attached to Western culture and too attached to Christianity to, to be able to be convinced into destroying the capitalist order. Therefore, we must destroy Western culture and destroy Christianity. And uh, otherwise, we will never be, have, uh, be able to have our uh, cultural revolution. And uh, uh, one good thing that Mussolini did is he imprisoned Gramsci. He said, <laughs> and, 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 so he said, give him a, a, a hat, hat tip, a hat tip to Benito Mussolini uh, for, for doing that when, when, after he started saying things like this, you know. And, and of course, Gramsci is known for, uh, uh, you know, Western culture and Christianity must be destroyed by a long march through the institutions of schools, media, churches, entertainment industry, Etc. And you know, so, you know I, be, I began noticing this: the, the real success that the Gramskyites and the, the cultural Marxists were having in the 1980s, when that great uh, intellectual giant Jesse Jackson led a uh, <laughs> led, led a, a, a group of chanting 500 or so chanting students at Stanford. They were chanting, "Hey, hey, ho, ho! Western cultures, Western civ has got to go." At the time, Stanford University was teaching a course in Western civilization, and they wanted to get rid of it, which they did, which they did. They got rid of it, and they replaced it with a course uh, called Race, Class, and Gender Studies. And so they succeeded in that. Around the same time, uh, there was a wealthy oil family from Texas, the Bass family, gave $20 million, $20 million to Yale University, which, which was sort of the family alma mater uh, there, and to endow some professorships and teaching various aspects of uh, Western civilization at Yale. And the faculty, not, all, not every single faculty member, but a, a big proportion, a big portion of the faculty revolted against this and ended up, they had to give the money back. They gave $20 million back. And, and at the time, it was the biggest donation ever in the history of Yale University, biggest private donation. So so if there are any uh, members of the Bass family watching, you know, I'm looking at the, they're on the internet, uh, uh, send the money to the Mises Institute. We, <laughs> we, we, uh, if they're out there on the internet. So, we will have we will have a uh, degree granting program in all aspects of Western civilization, if you like. <laughs> we could, we could do that with twenty million dollars. Okay, so yeah, so Stanford uh, replaced that. They gave the money back at Yale. The, the Yale faculty commend, uh, co condemned the, this proposal as uh, it was quote dead white European male academic agenda. And so they called for more multi. We, what we need is more multicultural studies. They said. And uh, you know, for those of you who are not familiar, too familiar with the multiculturalism in the academic context, 
It doesn't mean what you think it means. It means hiring socialists of different cultures, uh, an Asian socialist, an African socialist, you know, different cultures, an Indian socialist. So as long as the faculty are all socialists, we want them to be from different cultures. That's what, basically what multiculturalism means in the academic, academic world. Now, one of the heroes of the, uh, like I said, of the uh, today's uh, cultural Marxists who run the entire educational system in America is the Hungarian communist George Lukács. And he introduced, uh, he got a job in 1918 as Commissar of Culture in Hungary. And he introduced sex education in the, in, there. And his purpose was to destroy traditional sexual morals as a part of their plan to destroy Christianity. And the project was to destroy Christianity so that the, the, the great Marxist revolution of the working class could take place. Well, the Hungarians didn't really go for it, so they kicked out the communists. They, they totally kicked them out of the government. They, they, and it didn't quite work out that way. And of course, this is all a part of, you know, what this became was the Frankfurt School. Uh, basically, a, a gang of Marxist misfits and psychopaths, mostly from Germany and a few Italians in there. And they, they came to America and they went, of all places, and many of them ended up in Santa Monica, California uh, in the 1950s. And in the 1950s, Santa Monica must have been such a beautiful place. Uh, and, uh, and, but they were just angry and hateful and disgusted. They just hated everything. So they, were, they wrote articles and books about how horrible American society was, especially because it was, it was the most capitalist society around at the time. And they were just... They were just miserable, and they wanted everybody else to be miserable at the same time uh, about this. And so it was originally called the Institute for Marxism, but they decided that Marxism had kind of a bad name, so they, so they didn't quite, uh, you know, they eventually called it progressivism or, you know, whatever, but, they, uh, but that's what they called it. They, when they decided, let's just call us, ourselves the Frankfurt School, because who the heck knows what that is? <laughs> but the Institute for Marxism is, is a little different. Okay, and so the the, you know, the goal of the uh, of the Frankfurt School is that they said that well people live under repression in Western culture and must be liberated from this repression, uh, and so they use such techniques as lionizing uh, people like uh, Bruce Jenner in a miniskirt and high heels. That's supposed to be uh, you know, that sort of thing is supposed to uh, liberate us from our cultural repression. That's our new hero, a new new role model for society. People like that. Okay, the role of education, they said, is, they said, is not to educate, but to instill the right values. Okay, and the right values, and of course, when you see these th these scenes on college campuses now, when uh, you know uh, Charles Murray showed up at Middlebury College at the invitation of a of a, a philosophy professor there, they had these these uh, uh, muddle-headed little students showed up screaming in his face, calling him a fascist and a Nazi and all these things, and the, and the, the woman, the female uh, professor who had, who invited him, one of them grabbed her by the hair and jerked her so hard she injured her neck and had to go to the hospital in an emergency room, and, and they, they fled the campus. Charles Murray and this professor fled the campus, and these students chased them by car to, to, where, they were, to where they were going because they've been taught since grade school that these people are not only wrong, but they're evil. And that's always been the Marxist method of argumentation. Uh, they don't. They wouldn't. They would rarely argue with, with us. They would just uh, accuse us of being capitalist tools. Case closed. You know, you don't really believe what you're saying. You're a, uh, you're an intellectual prostitute. You're a capitalist tool, and so this is the modern version of capitalist tool. You're the tool of fascists or some some evil group, and so therefore, if you're a Nazi, well, of course, you need to be eradicated. We don't want Nazis. So that's what they're taught. That's that's why you have you know they use these these uh, young people as useful idiots, and they're, they're I've seen it my whole career. I began teaching in 1979. I noticed that the older leftists on campus would always go after sort of the dumber students. Like the, uh, I won't mention the majors, but education <laughs> education would be one of them. Uh, 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 they, would, they would go after and, and convince them to become uh, uh, radical rabble rousers rather than going to the library and studying and getting a good education. Okay, <clears throat> Another hero of this movement is uh, Herbert Marcuse. And uh, he wrote a book... Uh, uh, Eros and Civilization, which became sort of the Bible of the sexual revolution of the 60s. And one of the things he wrote in the book is, don't work, have sex. 
That's uh, that's good advice for teenagers, I, I guess. <laughs> good good career advice. Yeah, to, you know, this is part of it, just attack on the whole idea of working. You know, that's what makes the, that capitalist economy work, doesn't it? Work. Uh, you know, you know design, and, and so you know, demonizing work. He, and he advocated what was called polymorphous perversity. Because remember, the goal was always to destroy Western culture and Christianity. And it was uh, Marcuse who wrote an, uh, a, a, an essay that has been taken to heart by this movement in which he talked about liberating tolerance. He made the case for, uh, for ab the abolition of free speech among people who would advocate Western civilization, the values of Western civilization, including classical liberal ideas, free market economy, and so forth. And uh, because these are the ideas of the oppressor class, the oppressor class created these ideas and promulgates these ideas. And so, therefore, on college campuses especially, he said, it's only the oppressed who deserve free speech. So when you see these little terrorists doing things like they did at Middlebury College or Berkeley, the, uh, they, they think they're taking the moral high road by censoring alternative viewpoints. They don't think they're being, they're being fascist by, by destroying freedom of speech and academic freedom. They think that they, they'll tell you they're, doing, they're taking the moral high road because after all, if you believe in such things as free speech, uh, constitutionalism and all, you're, you're, a, you're a fascist. You're taught to be a fascist. And, and they did equate uh, Christianity with fascism too. Uh, traditional morality, just tr traditional morality uh, uh, is called fascist in this literature. So if you're a, uh, not just a Christian, but anybody who believes, say, that the Ten Commandments are a good guide for living, then you're a Nazi. You know, they, so they, equate, they equate you. That's why you see on college campuses these, these kids chanting, no more fascists, no more Nazis, you know. All this stuff. They have no idea what the heck they're talking about. But that's, that, but that's where this comes from. And they're the useful idiots of the professors who teach them these things. And who are, there's always a, a couple of professors who are behind all these riots on the campus. So they're never spontaneous, uh, like, the, like Ron Paul's End the Fed uh, thing was. And so, so that's, that's the, the destructionism of our time uh, that has is, that is festered for the past 30 years uh, in the American educational system and even, it's even worse in other places like England. And so uh, that's what I meant when I said it is not, uh, more important now than ever to support the work of the Mises Institute because you know, we're one of the groups that, that are still uh, doing everything we can to, uh, to educate these ideas uh, of the Austrian school, which of course are a very important part of Western civilization. And if you read Rothbard, of course, he wasn't just an economist. He was, he was a, a great scholar in all sorts of fields and, and of course, uh, classical liberalism. Uh, I'm teaching a course right now where the, the, I put uh, Mises' book Liberalism is on the second week class in the, in, the, in, the, in the reading, and these students have never heard of any of this. They're, they're all uh, sophomore, junior economics students, and, and, the, and they've never heard of any of this. When I brought Walter Williams to my university as one of my guest speakers, he, ga he gave his uh, canned speech on the Constitution, based, based sort of the, the economics and politics of the Constitution, why limited constitutional government is a good idea. And I had student after student, not just the economic students, come up to me and said, I never heard any of this. Thanks for, thanks for bringing this guy to campus. I never heard this argument. And these are, these are all young people who are 20, 21 years old. And, and their parents were paying 60000 a year for them to go to school. And it never it's the first time they ever heard these arguments. And so that, again, is why I think our work is, is urgent uh, today uh, that we do around here. And yeah, thank you very much. Time is up.